Hey, everybody. I'm honored to be here with Dr. Millie Rivera. She's the Director of Faculty Diversity, Inclusion, and Well-Being at George Mason University. She's an accomplished, result-driven academic professor with exceptional teaching and facilitating skills, proven experiences developing educational and training programs. Welcome, Millie. So glad that you agreed to do this. And thank you for asking me to be here. Um, my first question for you, you have a background that includes time living in different parts of the world and experiencing multiple cultures. How are empathy and compassion expressed in some of the cultures you've experienced? Thank you for that question. It, my mind goes in many directions, you know. Um, I lived in Puerto Rico since I was about three months old. I was born in New York and then I was raised in Puerto Rico. And when I was 22, I came to the U.S. And then after I finished my Ph.D., I lived in Asia and I taught in Singapore for 11 uh, years. And then I moved to South Africa and I worked there for seven years. So, you know, a big chunk of my experience was either growing up in Puerto Rico or in Asia. In some parts of Asia, I think there's so much poverty and suffering. When I traveled to some places, I really had to set myself up to be in a space where I could take it all in and not and not feel despondent or or or, or deeply sad and, and trying to then be fully present because I figure if people can live in those situations, I certainly can bear witness to it, right? Mm -hmm. And and one of the things that I that I expect that in some of these places, given that there's so much poverty and suffering, one would think that people are immune or have become desensitized to all of that, just coming at them constantly. Um, but I think the opposite is true, you know? There are millions of, millions of Buddhists throughout Asia, and empathy and compassion are part of many people's worldview. And to me, that was a huge revelation, right? Because I felt like an outsider looking in until I learned some of the cultures. And it has been my experience that in, that in, in some of these Asian countries, empathy and compassion as far as I could see, manifest as action, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when there is a disaster, when there are, and there are many of those, uh, and, we, and people have little money to, to even live their lives in a way that we in the West would consider to be um, safe or, or comfortable, right? But they come with whatever they can and they provide support to those who are suffering, who have less than them. And sure, there are instances, and, and I'm, it makes me sad when the news sort of capitalize on the fact that there's callousness and people probably um, take advantage of situations to, to, to steal children and, and traffic them and so on. But the truth is there's a gentleness in the way that people act, how they treat each other, how they support one another. And I think that in that respect, when I look at it, I see that compassion and empathy becomes part of their beingness. And, and it transcends religious differences also, right? Mm -hmm. um, because the news give us this impression that certain groups like Muslims are this way or that way. But truly, the compassion and the desire to help others and to lift them when they have everything around them collapsing exists across many, many groups. And, and for example, in Puerto Rico, where I grew up, there's a level of callousness and corruption that shocks me. The government is corrupt. People are sick of things not working the way they should. And with drug trafficking being rampant, mm -hmm. there are sometimes as many as 10 or 15 murders in a weekend. Mm -hmm. And all of them are gang drug related, right? Mm -hmm. And then you look below the surface and Puerto Ricans, despite being cynical and being exhausted from all this stuff, there's a sense of loving and generosity that shows up again when tragedy strikes, I think our walls go down and these defenses that we create to protect ourselves just go down and people then start helping each other. You know, they come to the rescue of those in need. They share whatever little they have. And when hurricanes hit communities and they hit my country almost every other year, those who have solar power, who have chainsaws, who have cold water, who have ice, generously share with their neighbors. And to me, that's one of the most touching and uplifting feelings to see that despite everything that's happening, all the bad things that happen, 
there's goodness in people and it shows up when you need it most, right? Um, for me, South Africa was a different place. That was the third place where I lived a significant amount of time. And I think what makes me sad about my time there was that the ethnic groups were so conditioned to distrust each other because of apartheid that I didn't really get a chance to connect very much with some of this group as, as, as I would have liked, right? But I did connect with the Muslim community there. My husband is a South African Muslim and they're a loving, kind and empathetic and compassionate people. Again, hearing all the stories you hear about Muslims and then being in the midst of that community are two completely different experiences because they really embrace their, their responsibility to share, to give, to be compassionate, not just during Ramadan, because that's that's part of their of their beliefs, but they do it throughout the year. They help people out. And and it's is is a way of manifesting your belief in God or something greater than you in a way that is tangible for those who are the beneficiaries of that kindness, right? Um, and and they, they're they generous with everyone, not just with, with those who are in their group or who share their beliefs. Um, and so for me, the, the exposure to all these different cultures reminds me that even if we don't share language, even if we don't share a religion, even if we have different ways of having brought up in life, that sense of our humanity connecting with each other is very present through through acts of kindness, compassion, empathy. And I see it all over the world. And, and this is one reason why, even if I don't understand the language, that is a language that all of us can connect with. It doesn't need words. Beautiful. Um, you, you highlight so many things. I mean, several of the questions I was gonna ask you, it's, it's like you've intuitively kind of responded to them. Um, one of the things that comes to my mind that you pointed out is how we have a negativity bias as a culture, and this is around the world. Our technology is looking for danger, right? And um, and the news capitalizes on that because it sells and it brings attention. Um, but the main fabric of humanity is that compassion and that kindness that you're talking about. Do you sense that different cultures um, assess different value to empathy and compassion? Yeah, I would say that. Um, you know, and as I said, the the area where I couldn't quite delve as much as I wanted to was the Black ethnic groups in South Africa. Um, and, and I never quite understood how they live their compassion and empathy because they were pretty much close to their own kind. And you can understand why. Uh, so as a foreigner, I never got the opportunity to learn much about their culture. The people that I did interact with, um, they have a deep connection to their ancestors, to the land, um, to connection. And they manifest that in many ways, right? Um, in ways that perhaps people in, in developed countries, as we call them, or, or the global north sees them as more acceptable. But the truth of the matter is that we all come from perhaps that ancestral space, right? In Africa, in some way or another. And and, and for me, what I really appreciated was the, the respect for the land, the respect for ancestors, the love and deference to elders which is something that, for example, in the Western culture does not exist to the same extent, depending on which cultures we're talking about. And so for me, that was one of the areas that I that I really connected because in my culture, Puerto Rico has African connections. And for us, our elders and our grandparents are highly respected. And, and that's something that I could connect. So that, that link to family and, and the kindness, the compassion, the, the connection that you create with those that have lived longer than you, that understand things differently from you, um, is something that I absolutely treasure in my experience. Um, in, the, in the other cultures in South Africa, they were more embracing and more open with others, perhaps because they didn't suffer to the extent that the Black ethnic groups did. Uh, everybody did suffer. I'm not saying they didn't. I just think that some groups were targeted more ruthlessly than others. Mm -hmm. um, 
And in Singapore, it was really interesting because I connected with many cultures. They have the Malay, which was mostly Muslims, Chinese, who were mostly Christians, although there were some Taoists and Buddhists. And then mm -hmm. the Indians who were mostly Hindus, although there were also some Christians. And each group learned and practiced empathy and compassion differently, right? Uh, at least from my perspective, as somebody who was trying avidly to learn about their culture. Uh, and, and the Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims, I felt, had a more universal way of practicing empathy and compassion, while the Christian groups were, in my experience, a bit more close and tended to gear their compassion and empathy more toward those of their own faith. So it was more like an in-group, out-group, where the other ones were more embracing, all-embracing. And... Um, so for me, that was that was interesting and in a way connecting to the fact that the Chinese in Singapore is the, 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 the majority culture, right? They're the largest mm -hmm. ethnic group. Uh, religion in terms of uh, uh, Christianity is the largest religion. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they sort of would take that and, and cover themselves with it. They were kind and I interacted with many people, but I felt that the other groups being minority groups open their hearts a little bit wider uh, and embrace pretty much anyone and everyone. And, and I felt it because I was always the, 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 the foreigner, right? Um, mm -hmm. Here in the US, I'm a Latina, I'm a Hispanic woman, I'm Puerto Rican, in Asia and Africa, I'm an American. And so I'm a completely different kind of person in their view. And I always felt embraced. I really did. And uh, especially Singapore. And to me, that was an amazing experience because I left Indiana in the U.S. feeling that I didn't connect with anybody. I felt so alone and isolated. And then I go to a country whose culture I don't understand, the languages I don't speak, and yet I'm embraced and I feel connected and I feel like I belong. And I think that's the power of, of compassion, kindness, and empathy, right? You can connect beyond all these other things that we think are important. Wonderful. And you bring up kind of the key issue, which is that we're all wired for empathy and compassion as humans. We also have our threat to survival wiring, and it depends which gets triggered. <laughs> and you Absolutely. mentioned the different like family, tribal, silo groups that can be very compassionate within themselves or not, depending on what's happening. But then sometimes the cutoff between groups in terms of communicating that empathy and that compassion. Um, given that subject, what do you see in terms of miscommunications where somebody is actually acting from a compassionate, empathic place, but somebody from a different cultural perspective isn't getting the message properly or misunderstand it? Do you see that happening at all? Because then my worry is then does that trigger putting up the defenses and getting militant rather than understanding the true message that's coming from the person? That's a really good question. Um, I think I think the things that can be triggers for people, um, and again, it was an interesting experience. I lived almost 11 years in Singapore and then I moved to South Africa. And everything that I did that worked in Singapore as an academic leader did not work at all in South Africa. And I was like, how can that be possible, right? Being kind and compassionate, uh, opening spaces for people to feel heard, seen and valued was highly appreciated in Singapore and was seen as a weakness and with suspicion in South Africa. And I would just sometimes think, what is it that I'm doing wrong? And, and I began to think maybe I, you know, leadership is not just a static thing, right? It's, it's, it's fluid and you sometimes need to adapt to situations as a leader. And, and that's what I did. Um, but I think the one thing that I found most telling for me is, is when we have people from different cultures and we tend to think a culture or a country as a culture, which is not true. Uh, but for example, in Puerto Rico, if I were to speak about where I grew up, there's this distinction between people who live in the city and many of them are educated and, and they have a certain socioeconomic status. And there's people who live in the, in the countryside or the, or the rural areas 
the assumption is they're less educated um, and they have less resources, right? And I think what I have found is that when people are humble, which I think is, a, is an incredibly powerful uh, attribute, certain people will see that as a weakness. And as a result, they're not really connecting because the person who is humbled is disrespected. And so they close up. And the person who is interacting with somebody who is humble uh, feels superior and doesn't think the other person can possibly understand what they're saying. And I've seen it happening many times. And again, I'm reminded of how, how powerful nature can be in, in tearing all of those things down. Uh, because Puerto Rico gets storms all the time, and, and lately they have been even more devastating. And, and one of the things that we see is a lot of people moving into the countryside or the rural areas, and they come there with a way of thinking and a way of living that is very different from the people who have lived for many years. And when you have a disaster, what do the humble people do who are looked down by the people with money? They pull out their chainsaws clean their own yards, clean the yard of the neighbors who don't have chainsaws, clean the streets so everybody can get through. And if their neighbor, even if it's somebody, like I mentioned, who has sort of set themselves aside, they go and help them out. And I think when I see that over and over and over, I'm reminded of how important um, it is to, to connect with people at the heart level, right? Because all the other things that we use to communicate with one another, are temporal or are potentially problematic because one, one side may not understand what the other one means. But when you operate from a space of the heart and from a space of compassion, kindness, service, I think those miscommunications disappear. And now we're communicating from human to human, right? Um, and so I've seen all of these differences and then I've seen how they all collapse when kindness sort of supersedes everything else. And people suddenly realize their neighbor may not be as educated, but they stood by me. They helped me out, even though I never gave them the time of day. And I think that has to be a transformative experience. It does sound like that's transformative. I've heard um, philosophies where there are people who are now saying, you take anybody from any place in the world and you pair them with somebody else from a so totally different circumstance and eventually they'll work out their common humanity which i think is an uplifting idea um and of course the things that get in the way are mistrust um pride, assumptions. Assumptions. assumptions misassumptions and misassumptions abound and, and they get magnified often in social media and so forth um so as you work with diversity and inclusion, what are some of the strategies that you use to help break down those barriers and help people really communicate authentically with each other so that they start to tap into the empathy instead of the warrior gene? What yeah, that's a really powerful question. You know, I, I in my work, I work with many groups on campus. And many of these people are DEI champions for many years, even when it didn't get called DEI, got called something else. But these are people who seek equity, who seek empowerment for everyone, opportunities for everyone, especially for our students who come from underprivileged backgrounds. Um, and many of these people have experienced trauma, personally in their lives, but also societal trauma, right? And, and often, their work is not really appreciated and their contributions are overlooked. And I see that all the time. So, so one of the things that I do when I lead meetings, which is often, I find that taking a moment to ask people to breathe, to relax, to become centered, and then use a word to express how they express how they feel is very powerful because often we go into, into autopilot. We, we sort of, you know, uh, there's an expression called already always listening. I'm always expecting certain things. And if I'm already expecting certain things, I may miss things that don't fit that expectation that I've created in my mind, right? So sometimes I believe in the power of pausing, stopping for a moment 
And and usually when I start the meeting, I I even if it's online, I can just from a few expressions or comments, I get the feel for the group. And I'm pausing and getting us to just connect to how we're feeling for a moment is really important because most people don't realize how powerful taking a moment to breathe can be and how it can break whatever it is that's going on in your head. It just brings you back to ground zero, uh, to feeling fully grounded and centered. So that's one of the practices that or strategies that I use when we're having group meetings with people that I know carry a lot of burdens. Well, that leads perfectly into my next question. And I apologize, somebody's blowing their lawn outside. So when I when I turn off my mute button, you'll probably hear somebody mowing their lawn. Um, what things, and you started down this path, so I'll put my last two questions together into a single question. What things have sustained your compassion and empathy along the way? And would you mind sharing one with us, kind of leading us through one of the things that you use to sustain your empathy and compassion? Um, yes, and, and I'll go back to what I said. I meditate, but sometimes I simply breathe, just pausing for a moment, especially when I when I find myself worrying about things that hasn't that haven't happened yet, that may or may not happen. Um just breathing, stopping, being fully present in the moment and letting my mind be still, to me, is very uplifting, but also very grounding. And it reminds me that I can't, I can't control what's happened. I can't control what may happen, but I'm, I can actually be in the moment fully present um, and connect to, to, to who I really am, right? And, and to who I want to show, uh, show up as and how I want to land with people when I connect with them. Um, I also spend time in silence. I can begin to tell you how important that is because we are constantly talking and, and, and I'm listening to people all day long. And when I get to my home, especially, I, I spend at least half an hour in silence, not thinking, just simply being, breathing, relaxing. And it allows me to just sort of get back into my center and to connect to that part of me that is loving, kind, compassionate, empathetic, that supports others. Because the more we give to others, people say we feel depleted, but it's really important to then feed yourself with what you need to sort of get back on track so you have more to give. Um, and in terms of a strategy uh, that I use for when I'm in groups and so on, you know, some of these groups have their own agendas and sometimes I'm in the midst of all these competing agendas um, and I can see them. I can see the way people speak and the things they say and I'm right there navigating all of that and trying to be as fluid and as open as I can, knowing that everybody has their own journey, their own challenges, their own wounds and we carry those and they sort of inform often how we relate to others, right? And I have found that, that many people who are very generous and compassionate and empathetic don't always know how to regenerate, don't even see themselves as compassionate or empathetic or generous, right? Because this is who they are and they're sort of oblivious to their own greatness. So often I hear them say that they feel depleted. So when I come into spaces and I feel this is happening, I ask for five minutes and then I walk them through a moment of pausing and connecting with their thoughts, what emotions are showing up, how is the body feeling? Because believe it or not, many people are not even in touch with their own bodies, right? And, and simply ask them to notice whatever shows up without judging it, just notice it. And I use the, the metaphor of a cloud, just notice what cloud is going through, what is it telling you? And then I ask them to take a few deep breaths and to imagine that their breath is like, a, and I love this image, a magic hand that comes and cleanses whatever it is that's causing that tension or that discomfort or that exhaustion, right? And ask them to imagine on the out breath that the hand throws it out and it becomes nothing because we don't want to pollute anything. So I tell them, just make it become nothing. And then I ask them to visualize 
how they feel. And to think of a person, a pet, a situation that brings a smile to their face or something that they're grateful for. And it's amazing in five minutes, the entire energy of the group can switch 360 degrees because it's powerful to, for a moment, notice what you're feeling, what's coming up into your thoughts, what thoughts are showing up, how is the body feeling, what emotions are just uh, sort of trying to bubble out and you're not letting them because you're totally blocked. And then would you ask them to smile about something or feel grateful about something? And then I ask, how was that like? There's this lightness and people feel very affirmed to be given the opportunity. And I always make time in all my meetings for that um, because I think we spend too much time just getting into practical things without thinking the toll so some of those things take on people. Um, and the other thing that I've begun to do is, is asking people to share their accomplishments, things that they're proud of having been able to do, personal and professional. And I always ask them to share both because I tell them sometimes just showing up despite everything that's going in your personal life is something you should be proud of, right? And, and it's really amazing how people celebrate each other. We just did it yesterday in a meeting and it was the last meeting of the semester. And I said, I want to set aside 30 minutes for this. And, and people spoke about all kinds of things and they celebrated and they used emoticons and they clapped and they did all these things for each other. And when we got to our business and we finished, I know they wanted to do more. They really feel affirmed. And I think we don't do enough of seeing others, affirming others, listening to them, really helping them feel that they matter. And for me, that's an expression of my compassion and my empathy because there are too many people around us who are suffering and yet they keep giving and giving and giving. And somebody has to remind them to stop, breathe, <laughs> so they can regenerate and give more. So that's sort of what I do. That's wonderful. I, when you were talking, I flashed back to a memory when I was a child. I grew up in Mexico, and so um, we would go to the Santa Fe um, Fiesta. Oh. And the village space of the Fiesta, and people from high economic status to low would all be there celebrating each other. And, and um, my sense of that would be the ideal community if if that part of us could come forward as a culture. So, um, Millie, I'm so grateful that you spent this time talking about your experiences and that you um, shared so many ways that we can recenter, reconnect, cross cultural boundaries to find that part of us that we all share. Um, are there any last thoughts you'd like to leave us with? As you're talking, I just had a memory. I went to Indonesia once and I lost my little book of phrases that I used to communicate when I travel. And I found a young man to take me into a lake and he and his helper were doing with the boat. And when we finished, we sat down and I bought a drum that we found a vendor selling on the side of the street. And with signs and smiles and playing the drum, we spent an incredible time together. And it reminds me of the fact that language makes things easier, sometimes not so. But when you connect with people at the level of the soul, at the level of the heart, uh, at the level of love, right? That's a memory I've never been able to get out of my mind, how we spent three hours together talking, laughing, connecting, and none of us spoke each other's language. And so there are other ways of connecting. And I think compassion, kindness, love, empathy, all of these things are so critical, especially when we are in a multicultural space where sometimes the language is not enough to help us connect with one another. Well, I'm sure I'm going to blow this quote because my memory being what it is. But for some reason, I'm thinking it's Helen Keller who said love is the language that even a deaf person can understand. Beautiful. And the blind, the blind can see. Um, but if I'm wrong, whoever said it. 
Well said. <laughs> kind of summing it up. Um, again, thank you so much for spending time with us. I really appreciate it.